Hi, Mick McQuaid here. I'd like to welcome you to ISTE 432 Database Application Development First Exam Review. So in this short video I'd like to give you some tips on how to take the exam and uh, share with you some possible exam questions. So the way to take the exam is to use the study guide and your own ingenuity. So all the material for the exam is taken from the study guide and in the sections from, from uh, uh, the part after review. So we're, this doesn't cover the review except uh, SQL could constitute review. Um, but we'll cover that separately outside the study guide uh, up through locking. So uh, how do you answer these questions? The questions are short answer questions on my courses and you uh, will need to write some detail on each question so that I know that you know what you're talking about. Don't create ambiguity. Don't say things like etc. at the end of your answer. Don't leave me wondering whether you really know what you're talking about. Be really explicit in your answers. I think that's the most important advice that I can give you is to be explicit. Maybe the second most important advice, because the most important advice is to read the questions. So I often find that students don't really read through the questions. They read through part of the question and think, oh, I know what this is about, and write something. And then a lot of the questions are two-part questions, and a lot of students write just to the first part of the question, which costs you a lot of points. So it's very important to read the questions and reread your answer after you after you answer the questions. Okay, now, so what are some of the questions that I'm likely to ask? Well, let me give you some examples. So, for example, what are problems that we face when determining log policies? So we've talked about log policies, and um, there's material in the study guide about that. So you have to think about that, what kinds of problems we face when we're determining log policies. Another one is uh, how much space do transaction logs take as a function of uh, the number of transactions? And that's as a function of the number of transactions, not in terms of uh, fields. It's a question asking specifically about uh, the relationship between the logs and the number of transactions. What are the options for recovery after a database catastrophe? That one is mostly in the study guide. That one you can mostly answer without um, recourse to thinking too much about it. But you do need to organize your answer. Um, can you guarantee the manager that spending enough money will prevent all database catastrophes? If not, can you, how can you describe to the manager in a concise way what kinds of problems you will have? So that question requires you to think about how you would communicate with a manager who isn't necessarily uh, database savvy, um, a manager who isn't technically savvy. Um, why would you lock the database at the field level rather than the table level? That's pretty much a technical question. Um, and again, like like all of these, you can find some information in the uh, in the study guide, and then you have to apply some thinking to that. Suppose you have customers of the database who are paid very little and have to enter orders from the firm's customers and modify orders of firm's customers in the database, and the firm's website needs to be maintained to a high standard of concurrency and consistency. Are you more likely to advise locking at the table level or the record level, and why? So here again is something that you can find a piece of information that will serve you well in the study guide, and then you have to think about the question. You have to think about the terms of the question. Here's another similar kind of question. Suppose your customers are senior physicians recording information about heart surgery, which is one of the most lucrative uh, medical practices, into the hospital's database and each physician's team members will review the physician's entries. Are you more likely to advise locking at the table level or the record level, and why? 
Suppose your customers, here, here's another one of, of a similar kind. Suppose your customers are internal to your company and understand the consequences of having to rework transactions. Will you be more likely to favor optimistic locking or pessimistic locking, and why? And in all of these, you have to give the answer, you know, one or the other, and then you have to say why. Suppose your customers are visitors to your firm's website and your firm is an airline and you need to satisfy their plane reservation requests at peak times. Will you be more likely to favor optimistic locking or pessimistic locking and why? Uh, describe deadlock and give an example of deadlock. For a database application used by your sales staff, uh, in the field while they speak to customers and potentially read and write to the database, are you more likely to favor shared locking or exclusive locking? And, as usual, why? For a database application used by the unassisted public to make purchases, for example, uh, Amazon.com, are you more likely to favor shared locking or exclusive locking and why? Define data integrity in a way that gives some characteristics that we could measure in a real database to assess data integrity. Identify and define two central measurable goals for multi-user database systems that are not data integrity. I've actually had somebody answer data integrity to that one. Just read the question. Why might a database system practice transaction isolation? What is, a con what is contention? And how can a database administrator obtain more of it? How can the database administrator obtain less of it? And remember, I'm asking about actions that the database administrator can do, not just circumstances. Describe two ways that a lock can be released. What is meant by the term dirty reads? Give one reason why a database administrator might not do everything uh, possible to prevent them. What is meant by the term non-repeatable reads? Give one reason why a database administrator might not do everything possible to prevent them. Identify two conflicting goals that a database administrator balances by using a specific locking approach. Okay, and then, so that's all the thought questions now, or, well, um, let's say essay questions, I guess. Um, and now there are some SQL questions. So write a SQL query to return rows of the facilities table with a cost greater than 10 and a facility ID of 1 or 5. And uh, I should mention here, I forgot to, to say that I will give you a sheet um, showing the tables and the relationship of the tables in advance. And the picture on the sheet will be the picture that we go over in class from PG exercises. And these questions are all about the database in PG exercises. Write an SQL query to return the names of facilities and a label of pricey or cheap, depending on whether their monthly maintenance is more than 100. Write an SQL query to return start times of bookings on tennis courts for 2012-921, ordered by start time. And so I'm, when I say 2012-921, I mean that as a, as a uh, date label. Write an SQL query to return uh, first name and surname of members who've recommended a member, ordered by first name and surname. Ordered by surname and first name, actually. Uh, and then finally, write an SQL query to return first name and surname concatenated as member of members who had a booking on 2012-914 that cost more than 30 for a member or 40 for a guest, ordered by descending cost. So all of those um, SQL questions are actually taken from uh, or are very slight rewritings of questions in PG exercises. So this should test whether you're, this, this should adequately test whether you're fine on SQL and we don't need to discuss SQL further. If you do well on this, if, if in general the class does well on this uh, portion of the exam, 
I won't ask you about SQL um, except in one little exercise and that exercise is intended mainly to um, help you stand up a database quickly in a different uh, database management system. So we won't do much with SQL if things go well on this. Um, what else can I tell you about this exam? Uh, pretty much, you know, take seriously the question examples that I've given you. These are actual questions from actual exams. And, um, oh, the number of questions is important. There will be 20 to 25 questions. I think 25 questions total. So there shouldn't be too much time pressure. Um, but you shouldn't waste a lot of time on one question. You should, if, if you, a question, if you find a question puzzling, you should go on to another question and uh, budget your time. So uh, if you have 25 uh, questions, you're going to spend roughly uh, two minutes per question. So budget your time that way uh, for a 50 minute period. Okay, and, and um, although I'll be out of town, I'll be available by email. And if you ask me a question that seems like it would be relevant to other students, um, I will um, answer to the whole class. Um, I won't give your name, of course, but I'll, I'll answer to the whole class. So you should expect to get some, uh, some emails from me if there are uh, questions from anybody. Alright, good luck on the exam and thanks for watching this.